Thanks very much. A um, little bit self-conscious being this close to the front with people that can look up your nostril. So uh, Arjun's done a check for me. Apparently I'm all good to go. Um, I just want to thank the organising committee for inviting me to speak. Um, I have tried as much as I can to format slides in a forum where you don't use a lectern. Um, I have a probably disclaim with that that I probably haven't been able to do it as effectively as I can because I think some of the nuances with SVT don't really fit into that um, sort of uh, presentation style, unfortunately. So the first disclaimer is I'm not a cardiologist. My interest in pedi interest SVT came about because for a long time treating adult SVT was pretty straightforward and most people went home from my emergency department. But when I started to deal with infants with SVT, I started to see a lot of things that I hadn't seen before with adults. And certainly being on a retrieval phone call, similar things happened. And I decided to try and understand a little bit more about it and found out that it is actually a very different disease. And the idea here is obviously to try and uh, enlighten some of you if you don't already know this. Um, the first thing we do is define SVT because I think it's not clear. Um, remind us a little bit, unfortunately, of the boring electrophysiology, but to understand what you're trying to achieve, I think it is important to, to go through that. Uh, we'll think about a fictitious case, but num most of what I'm showing is based on true cases that are, um, I've either been involved with or, or been told about. And then five things that I'm going to try and uh, help you with is things to think about whether adenosine fails and the five outcomes you might get from adenosine and how to manage those if you're not anticipating them. So, unfortunately we have to go through normal cardiac conduction. And the reason for this is that you understand why we have good cardiac output. The sinus node obviously sends out actually three mainly pathways that stimulate the left and right atrium and they give you your pre-systolic kick. There's a a fibrous septum across this area over here that prevents conduction so that it's not chaotic. The only way for atrial activity to get through the ventricle is through the AV node, and the AV node is under autonomic control and can determine at what rate that, that impulse is conducted. And once conducted, it goes down the right bundle or one of the two left anterior and left posterior fascicles. And those, again, are very specifically designed to ensure that the heart contracts from base to apex and pushes blood out through either your pulmonary or, or aorta. Pulmonary, vein, pulmonary artery or aorta. And those are crucial for good cardiac output. Okay, so what is SVT? Well, usually if you stand on a ward and say, hi, this kid with SVT, you mean a narrow complex re-entry tachycardia. And why do I say that? Because actually, SVT includes all these other things too. AF is, is, is SVT, atrial flutter is an SVT, paroxysmal atrial tachy, junctional tachy, and there are a whole lot of other ones, which are sort of highlighted in this picture to some extent, but I'm not going to go through those in a lot of detail. We're talking about the re-entry tachycardia known as SVT. So, let's go to that. What is a re-entry tachycardia? Well, when we talk about re-entry uh, narrow complex tachycardias, there's either AV nodal re-entry tachycardia, which involves a re-entry circuit that occurs somewhere in the AV node, uh, and I'll highlight that in a second, or AV re-entry tachycardia, the AVRTs, and that involves a circuit that tends to be somewhere in the ventricle and goes back into the atrium, usually via, as you can see over here, the fibrous septum, a perforation in the fibrous septum. Now, the fibrous septum is, is as I said, fibrous and non-conducting, and all an accessory pathway is, as exciting as it sounds, is simply a perforation of that with normal atri atrial or ventricular tissue, usually sodium-based tissue, not calcium-based tissue. And so the way it behaves, and the way you can manage it and manage it is with sodium channel blocking agents, for example. And there's some nuances to how you manage patients that have uh, electricity passing through these pathways. So you're either going to go round and round in this area or you're going to go round and round in this bigger circuit. That being AV nodal, this being AV reentry tachycardia. Now I'm just going to highlight what, how, how, how these things come about. And we're going to focus a little bit on a microscopic version of that AV node. So what's going on is, and this happens in all of us to some extent, and, and it can be variable how fast or slow these pathways are. But the AV node has both a fast and a slow tract. Um, and for most of the time when your impulses travel down, uh, they somehow get through the fast and slow tracts and then go on to you know, stimulate your bundle of hiss, and so you go on to stimulate your ventricle as you're supposed to. Um, there are some theories that the one tract actually supplies the right bundle and the other tract supplies the left bundle, but I'm not going to go into that in more detail. What happens sometimes is you get a small area of increased automaticity somewhere in the atrium that starts to impulse. That might be from a stretch, a fever, stimulation, ventolin, whatever you like. Uh, that little area starts to make a little bit of its own electricity somewhere in the atrium. And what happens is it stimulates the AV node at a time when one part of the cycle is refractory, but the other half can conduct. 
And so what happens then is the impulse is transmitted down the one side of the pathway but not the other. But what happens then is when that impulse gets to the bottom of that pathway, it can actually go back up here. This area that was right once refractory is now no longer refractory in time. And so you get a retrograde pathway going up the other side of the AV node. And what ends up is you have a circuit. And that is what SVT is. It's a re-entry circuit within the AV node, usually set up by some sort of atrial activity or excitation in the, AV, uh, in the atrium somewhere. Now, on a bigger scale, what's happening with AV re-entry tachycardia not involving the node is a similar thing. Uh, it's just that it goes up an accessory pathway. Okay, so we've talked about that, and why it's important is adults, 80% of the time, have just that nodal re-entry tachycardia going on. But infants, 80% of the time, if not more, somewhere between 70 and 90, actually utilise the uh, accessory pathway. They've got a perforation somewhere in their septum, usually the bundle of uh, whatever, the uh, Wolf Parkinson White, um, w which is where they, there's a sort of defect in the left lateral part of the ventricle, and they go through that area there most of the time. And I'll show you why this is important. Just to go on the aim of treatment, we've got two circuits here, either the AV nodal reentry or the AV reentry tachycardia. Both use the AV node either way. How do we treat? We do something that stops conduction through the AV node. That's what we're trying to do, stop the AV node so that we pause this process and hope that in the interim the, a, the SA node takes over again as the primary pacemaker. Okay, so we think about a case, four month old male, short of breath, poor feeding for two days, local doctor thought maybe bronchiolitis, not unreasonably, sent them in for assessment, an astute triage nurse finds that the pulse rate is 260 with some pulse oximetry and puts them into your resuscitation bay and this child looks pink and well and stable and that's what their monitor looks like approximately. Okay, so this is what you'd probably expect to see on the monitor. And this is your, S this is your ECG, 12 lead. Was everybody comfortable that this is SVT? I think we would be. Fast, not, there, there can be atrial tachycardias being conducted one to one that can do this, but statistically this is most likely gonna be SVT. Okay, but what about this? A broad complex. Going fast looks like that. Who's confident that this is SVT? Hands up if you think it's SVT. Hands up if you think it's VT. Okay, so you know, for for all for those that know all the nuances of looking at an ECG, there are factors here that tell you this is probably not VT. But for most teaching, if it's broad complex, it's VT until proven otherwise. And I'm not going to, th going to go through all the facts that say that this is SVT. But there are things like non-concordance and no fusion beats and no left axis and a few other things. But the important thing is statistics and understanding whether you're dealing with a normal heart in a, in a child or some sort of congenital heart disease. And if this is a normal child, then what's happening is they've got um, a, a retrograde conduction through their AV node going through the accessory pathway. And what I mean by that is we've already talked about the fact that AV reentry tachycardia is sort of this normal path where you stimulate your ventricles in the normal way and go back up through this pathway. But what can happen, and will happen a lot in pediatrics up to 5% of the time, is it can be going the other way called orthodromic conduction. And it'll then, because it stimulates the ventricle initially from this left uh, ventricular tissue, its depolarization across the right and left ventricles make it broad complex. But the important thing to understand is, as I've said over there, most uh, Broad complex tachyrhythmies in infants are still SVT, 95%. And that's really the first take home message on just looking at SVT in pediatrics. But in infants, should I say, that the broad complex is going to be SVT most of the time. Now, congenital heart disease and other congenital other disease, heart disease aside, you have to take that into account. So back to our child who's stable. We're going to talk about what to do next. Physiological reversion. Now, to understand the diving reflex, I first have talked about Valsalva. So what is Valsalva? Well, this is the way I like to do Valsalva in a person who can cooperate. And it's not the way this, this, this group did it, but I, I'm going to pretend that in his hand he has a little pipe, and that pipe is attached to that sphygmonometer that you see in the foreground over there. And you ask the patient to blow in, get the, the, measure, the, the, the sphygmonometer to blow up to 40 millilitres of mercury, and you let them do that for 15 seconds. What's happening while that's going on? Well, initially when you squeeze on the heart, you get a bit of increased output, a little bit of stimulus of your carotid and other baroreceptors, and you get a little bit of increase in blood pressure. But then with sustained pressure, what tends to happen is your blood volume is being trapped in your lower limbs and up in your head with distended neck veins and below your diaphragm, and you're running out of blood. 
So what does the, uh, the, the atrium do? It starts to pump, it starts to recognize this, and you start to get a stimulation where the heart gets faster and faster, pumps harder and harder, faster and faster, harder and harder, your blood pressure's dropping, faster and faster, harder and harder, then you suddenly release, and this primed myocardium allows all this blood to rush back into it, and it smashes the left side of your heart. You get this massive outflow of blood into your left carotid baris, uh, your aortic and carotid baroreceptors, and through there you get this massive vagal inhibition. That's how the Valsalva maneuver works. It works better as well if you lift up the legs and drop the patient because you're going to increase that venous return and make that response more dramatic. So why is this description important for understanding the diving reflex? Well, it's important because a baby can't do Valsalva. I mean, they might when they cry, and we know that happens. But the diving reflex probably has two actions. The first is pretty much what we've already seen. The vasoconstriction, when you get into... Next time you get into a cool swimming pool and lower yourself in, try not go... <gasps> The reason you're doing that is a massive amount of vasoconstriction. Your hands, feet, and face have 10 times the heat and cold receptors. They explore your environment. They protect you in trying to maintain homeostasis. As you go into that cool environment to preserve heat, you vasoconstrict to the core. And that may, means a massive shunt of blood to the central circulation that your heart has to manage, pumping into your lungs, and you take a deep breath. That's what happens. What's going to happen to the baby is a similar thing. When you put an infant in, in some sort of exposure to a cold environment, particularly their face, they're going to get profound vasoconstriction, and they're going to do very much what the Valsalva does. They're going to bring all this blood back to the heart. Now, what I haven't mentioned up to this point is you've got to have a, a, a well-functioning heart. That patient, that adult that did that Valsalva, if he had terrible heart failure, he would not have a result from a Valsalva maneuver because all that blood rushing to the back of his heart wouldn't be able to be pumped out effectively. So the question is, can the diving reflex work in a child that might even be in heart failure when they're in SVT? And interestingly, there's lots of papers that show that it does. And the reason for that is there's a second pathway that goes through facial stimulation of cold blood that probably goes in through different receptors, including glossopharyngeal and, and, and different uh, nerve fibers in the, in the fifth nerve, to the hypothalamus. That is an instinct that says, we're in a cool environment, we need to preserve ourselves. That means slowing the heart down and decreasing metabolism. Um, and, and that's a really important part. And the reason this is important is because children in failure may still respond to the diving reflex, whereas adults with failure won't respond to a Valsalva. So it's always worth doing. The other thing is, because it's a, general, a generic sort of response rather than a specific response, it actually affects atrial tissue, and atrial tachycardias can also be aborted with a diving reflex. One of the best ways to do it without dunking a child in water is to immerse one of these masks into a slurry of cold ice water and put it in their face to 30 to 40 seconds, you get the same result as you would putting them upside down in water and distressing the family. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so let's go back to our case, who's stable, going fast, what are we gonna do? Adenosine is our next, we presume, we presume that our facial ice hasn't worked. So the important thing to understand about adenosine is the mechanism of action. What it does is it opens potassium channels for a very brief period that depolarizes the AV node, makes it non-excitable. You hope to break the circuit and hope the SA node is going to take over. It only has a half-life of 10 seconds. The guidelines we're given suggest that we should probably begin about 100 mics per kilo first and then work our way up to certain maximums and even lower maximums in neonates. So let's say we see our first child, 100 mics per kilogram. We give the drug. We get a lovely reversion, and um, we're watching very closely, hoping for the best, and we're lucky this child eventually picks up sinus rhythm, <laughs> sigh of relief, and slowly, and they often do this, they often go into recovery tachycardia because they've got a net sort of deoxygenation that's been going on with this tachycardia for a long period of time, and they pick up into normal SV, in normal sinus tachycardia, but we're happy and hosed, everybody's high-fiving, we leave the room. Now, in adults, you'd send them home and, you know, tell them to stop taking Red Bull, but um, in a child, the important thing is they do need cardiology follow-up, and the reason is children can't tell us that they're going in SVT. They can be going for days before someone recognizes it. And they get prophylaxed for their first, their first of getting investigated in case there's some other things causing it, which I'll come to later. But the important thing is prophylaxis. They need to be on medications to prevent them going three or four days without being in SVT and presenting in failure or in cardiac collapse at a later stage. So this is one of the first responses to adenosine that we all hope for, and most of the time happens, and that's reversion. Okay, here's our second case. We give our adenosine, we're waiting, we're waiting. And nothing happens. I'm sure that's happened to you. And these are the five things I want you to think about, and they're called the five Ds when adenosine doesn't do anything. The first thing is delivery. Have you got the arm up, a three-way tap, a large vein, a, 
a, a bolus straight after your, a flush bolus straight after you give the adenosine, delivering it fast and rapidly because of its short half-life? Yes. Distance. Where are you doing it from? Are you doing it from the foot or from the cubital fossa? Obviously, the further away you are, you need to adjust for how much adenosine you're using and how you expect it to work. Because the 100 mics per kilo is generic, but if it's coming from the toe, it's metabolized by the time it's hit the groin. The next thing is the dose. Interestingly, all the guidelines, they start at 100. In fact, at Sydney Kids, we should start at 50. But um, the studies will suggest that most need an average of 170 to 200 to revert. And so I think particularly if you're not in a big fat cubital fossa vein and you're starting beyond that, go with 200 mics per kilo up front. But, and also intraosseous, again, you may have to lift your seeding beyond 500. There are anic certainly in porcine models, uh, uh, intraosseous works, but in certain other models, uh, and certainly uh, anecdotally, there, there are times when adenosine has failed in a child that's been in distress and in failure with, with an IO working, uh, being used, and there are times when it has been successful. I think all you have to be thinking about is what's going on. How far am I from the heart with this cannula? What, what are the circumstances for perfusion? How well am I able to bolus this tiny cannula? And therefore, this is just a number. 100 mics per kilo to maximum 500 is a number. What I want to know, what I want to do is get a package of adenosine to the heart to work. And if it's not working because I'm in the foot, it's because the dose isn't high enough. I need to keep going. The next thing is drugs, and you're not likely to encounter this in an infant, but we spoke about it Theophylline a few times in this conference already, and it certainly competes at the adenosine receptor, and therefore you need a higher dose if the child happens to be on Theophylline. So it might not work for that reason. And then another thing that can be very challenging, which I learned in adults. What I learned with adults is I gave a gentleman an SVT just like this, a big dose of adenosine, and I waited, and nothing happened. But the guy went, <gasps> like you, that awful feeling that people get. But nothing happened to the ECG trace. And I thought, that's bizarre. I always thought it was because your heart kind of goes into that clunking, awful feeling. You think it's going to start sometime soon. That must feel awful. But in fact, he got that feeling. And we know now with asthma and things like that, that there's a small amount of bronchoconstriction that occurs with adenosine that probably is partially responsible for that awful feeling of doom and death. And what it, what it made me realize was there's something wrong with this gentleman, that he wasn't responding, he had some sort of other cause. And what he had, and you can certainly have it in infants as well, is fascicular VT. And fascicular VT is when you have a small little focus that sits up in the bundle of his, it's like a VT over there, and, it, and it's a circuit that because it starts at the bundle of his, remains narrow. So it's a narrow complex tachycardia that does not respond to adenosine. And the other one is Lone Ganong Levine syndrome, which I again won't go into, but it's basically when you have an atrial tachycardia that bypasses the AV node. So when you're doing repetitive doses from a cubital fossa and the baby's not responding, infant's not responding, there's probably an alternative diagnosis you need to think about as well. So those are my five Ds. Okay, now let's say we've given 100 mics and it's done exactly what you'll see now, and then we've given 200 mics and it's done exactly what you've seen now. I want to know what you're going to do about this sort of patient. Almost half farming, about to leave. Bugger. And this has happened twice. So the question is, what do you do with this group? And these are called the recurrence or a triggering group. And the important thing here, as we've already discussed, is that these are triggered often by some sort of area of increased automaticity in the atrium. I'm not going to talk about incessant SVT, but it is peculiar and particular to infants where the SA node can actually be responsible for re-triggering all the time just because of the nature of the fast and slow pathway in the AV node. But the important thing to notice is it's, there's no point often going on and on and on giving adenosine, watching that long pause, and they just go back into SVT. What you need to do is treat the thing that's triggering it. And uh, usually that regards, r r requires second agent. So if I just go through that... Uh, that strip once more and just point out when you're watching this go by, what you see here is little areas of increased atrial automaticity, these little things popping up. And that's going to trigger, that's not the SA node, you can see they're not related to the, a, to the uh, AV node all the time, they've got variable relationship between that and the QRS. They are re-triggering this SVT. If you don't get rid of that area, it's going to just keep on re-triggering, you've got to manage that. And how you do that is choosing a second agent, and certainly in, in the adult environment, we use a bit of metoprolol or something like that, it'll slow them down and you can reuse adenosine. In the pediatric environment, I'd obviously suggest you talk to your cardiologist. I'll talk about second agents in a, in a moment, uh, when we look at the next scenario. Um, so that's the re-triggering or uh, 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 recalcitrant group. Then there's this sort of response you might get from giving uh, 100 mics per kilo. Ah, this is the wrong one. Hmm. Don't know how that happened. We changed something this morning, and I apologize. What that one actually showed was um, 
atrial flutter hiding behind SVT, which means you expose a tach uh, an atrial tachyarrhythmia. So essentially you see the, uh, the, the, the pause stop, you see an atrial tachycardia behind it. There's no point going on and slamming that child with more adenosine, what you have to recognize is there's an atrial tachycardia going on, which is sitting up here somewhere, it might be um, in the uh, uh, flutter, which might be up in the coronary sinus, or it might be atrial fibrillation, or it might be paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, but that is what's being conducted through the AV node, looking like SVT, but when you actually ablate the AV node, all you see is this background atrial tachycardia going on. Um, and that's really important to recognize because once again, we don't treat the SVT anymore, the AV node, we treat, this, we treat the uh, atrial tachycardia usually with a second line agent or therapy. Now the other therapies might involve cardioversion, they might involve uh, um, overdrive pacing. Um, as far as second line agents go, Interesting, when I looked, because I, I was always intrigued, you know, we're quite free with amiodarone and, and sotol on these sort of drugs in pediatric, in, in, in adults, but um, when I looked up the, the data and literature on it, amiodarone's a pretty scary drug in infants, that it's, uh, if it's given slowly and, and, and a, at a lowish dose, it's great, but it's not effective, and if it's given at the right dose, more rapidly, it's effective, but it has a higher side effect profile, which include, you know, hypertension collapse, which none of us want. Um, Sotolol is probably the preferred drug at Sydney kids with our cardiologists. Again, it's a, it, it cardioverts as well as rate controls. Sometimes with this group, all you're trying to do is rate control them. You don't want them going at 280. You might not get rid of the arrhythmia. You just want them somewhere in the 200 range, A180 to 200 range, and these drugs can do that for you. You have to obviously think about whether they've got underlying congenital heart disease or heart failure th first, and that's why you'd have a discussion with your cardiologist because some of them might warrant an echo, or you might have to tread very gently with, with, with guidance. So. Um, Okay, so what's happened now is, uh, and I'm not sure why this happened, but that's all right. I'll go back to that other one because that's the, uh, that's the one that should go along with the next slide, and I apologize for this. I'm hoping it's going to work. So this will apply to the very last slide. Um, you get this patient, so you've given them the adenosine, and you've got it, this is time-lapse camera. This is going fast, so... Yeah, a minute here is five seconds. What I'm demonstrating is this child recovers to sinus rhythm. Their blood pressure initially was sort of in the 90 range. And you look now, and it's dropped to 56 on 28. And your SATs are starting to drop because they're developing pulmonary edema and heart failure. And I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but this has happened to me on two occasions. And uh, we're going to find out very quickly why that happens by just going quickly past it, and I apologize for that. And this is where you sometimes unmask conge congestive cardiac failure. So there's a number of reasons this might happen. Up to children with congenital heart disease, up to 25% may present with SVT. And so this might be your coarctation of the aorta or your patent, your PDA, et cetera, presenting in the first few weeks or months of life that you've missed. There's also tachyopathy-induced CCF. Children that have been going at, at 280 for more than 48 hours, about half of them will be in failure when they present if they've been going for more than 48 hours. For a number of reasons that myocardium doesn't enjoy this, doesn't get good perfusion, and, uh, the, and even though you get them back, the, their rates is what's keeping them going. When you take that rate away and they're back to 120, 140, their normal rate, they've got this floppy, myopathic, tachymyopathic myocardium that doesn't recover very well. They may also have myocarditis or cardiomyopathies as congenital heart disease or things that are acquired. And very rarely, they may even deteriorate into VT and VF. There are some, some uh, articles saying that that may occur. So you need to be ready for this sort of occurrence. So I'm just going to summarize. With adenosine, you've got five responses, either reversion, which most of the time is what happens and we hope for, but there may be the non-response, we're about the five Ds. There's reversion with no tachyl arrhythmia, but re-triggering, and you need to treat the re-triggering. There's atrial tachyarrhythmias that get unmasked, and you need to treat the atrial tachyarrhythmia. And there's the occasion where you might get caught out where a child collapses or looks worse straight afterwards. You need to be able to manage that. And that might include using inotropes and, and failure management, or in the case of obviously VTVF, cardioverting. And there are a number of papers that suggest when we are dealing with infants that we're reverting, we should probably have the paddles on in case you get faced with this scenario. Okay, thanks very much. I'll leave that on to talk about because I've gone way over time, I think. Uh, we did run late today, so some, uh, thank you.